Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about uh, breast implant illness and I want to share with you some of the research that's been published on it and I also want to talk to you about some of the limitations of the research and then I want to also talk to you about some of the mechanisms um, using our contemporary understandings of toxicology and immune tolerance as it relates to uh, breast implant illness and uh, um, th the first thing is if you're not familiar with uh, breast implant illness it's basically, con it's basically a condition in which women that have had breast implants notice some degree of symptoms afterwards and the time span can be immediate to years later but the most common symptoms that they have is basically fatigue, joint pain, um, uh, mood changes, uh, swelling, sleep disturbances, uh, rashes throughout their body. Um, some even go on to <clears throat> develop an autoimmune disease which um, some people become suspicious if that was one of the triggers for their autoimmune disease but it's basically inflammation, um, a poor functioning brain, and general fatigue. Those are the main symptoms. So the interesting thing about breast implant illness is when you look at it, um, and you look at the studies done on it, it doesn't always have to also involve leakage of the breast implant. So let me go over a few important concepts first. Um, first of all, the question of like saline versus uh, silicone doesn't really matter. There's uh, at least 50 known toxic substances in current breast implants, whether they're um, silicone or saline. Um, there's benzenes, there's formaldehydes, there's many, many different compounds in it besides just the saline or silicone. And secondly, you don't have to have leakage to develop symptoms. If there is leakage, then there's a bigger concern. Um, and then one of the thought processes that takes place is that if you actually have breast illness syndrome, you have to have leakage or you have to have um, fluid around the breast. Like sometimes they'll do an ultrasound around the breast implant and the, they don't see significant um, fluid around it or scarring. They kind of dismiss the condition, but that's not an accurate way to look at it. So those things don't have to happen. Now, the tricky part is there is really no laboratory test or any diagnostic criteria to determine if a person that has breast implants is starting to develop breast uh, implant illness. Uh, so that's one of the areas that becomes very frustrating. And to be quite honest, you don't really know uh, if the breast implants were actually causing a problem unless they're removed. So the, the problem we have right now is we don't know what the risk factors are known and published that can cause a person to react to breast implants. Certainly there's some mechanisms that can be involved relating to uh, immunological fitness. Um, and the ability to metabolize uh, um, chemicals. The second issue is, um, since we don't know what those risk factors are, we don't know which people should consider not considering it. If they do have a breast implant, we don't necessarily know that that's making them ill or sick. Now, there was a recent, uh, and when you look at the literature, you know they haven't done these uh, multiple randomized clinical trials where you look at all these different uh, factors and compare one group to the other and have, <clears throat> have, have real uh, clear evidence. There are some studies that are coming out. One of the most recent studies was a study that was published in the Annals of Plastic Surgery, just published July 2020. And what they did is they looked at 750 women that had their breast implants removed and they wanted to look at their most common symptoms and they checked joint, joint, joint muscle pain, memory issues, um, fatigue, uh, rashes, um, uh, the breathing and so forth. And they wanted to see if, it, if those symptoms changed. And they found, they found that in 750 patients when they did retrospective analysis, when they went back and determined for the, in a group of patients that have had the breast implants removed and how they felt, they, felt they, they found that there was um, some improvement in some of these systems. They were not all statistically significant, which could mean that uh, it didn't really, wasn't really that accurate and, and maybe the population sample was too small. And retrospective studies are not really the, the highest level of evidence. So this is a frustration people have when they're trying to understand breast illness syndrome is they just, there isn't a lot of good research and studies done out there and it's actually very hard to design a um, clinical trial to do this and the time, energy, and money involved with this will take some time. So if you're suffering from an autoimmune disease or chronic inflammation or brain fog, and you think you may have breast illness syndrome, then you, there isn't uh, um, an enormous amount of evidence to support you should that it is the cause or there's also not a lot of evidence saying you shouldn't take them out. So, I mean, obviously for most people, if they're chronically sick, they're going to take them out because they don't want to, they don't want to deal with the risk factors. So 
when you look at breast implants, that breast implant illness, that's one of the frustrations that we that that clinically are there. And so we don't know what the risk factors are typically, um, at least published, that can that can make us some some people have some issues with it. Obviously, things like autoimmunity, inflammation. If you have a chronic inflammatory condition, um, if you have an autoimmune disease, if you have uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome. Anything that is really inflammatory and has already signs of immune dysregulation, it's, it's never a good idea to add chemicals into the mix. If there's a history of autoimmune disease in the family, it's probably not a good idea to add chemicals to the mix. Now, um, the other issue is that there's lots of criticism between some of these research where they just do a questionnaire and ask the patient if they feel better because for most people that have the implants removed, um, they may feel like they feel better because they were so worried about it now that it's out, they can relax. So there hasn't been a lot of studies done where it's, they're looking at physiological changes, actually there aren't any studies, where they really look at immune panels changing and immune markers changing and inflammatory markers changing. What we we'll really have is questionnaires. Now, the mind is really powerful, so from a psychoneuroimmune response, if you think someone's caused, if something is causing you illness and you remove that, that may have tremendous benefits on your health, whether um, the physiology was published in the literature or not, it's, it's, it's important for you. Now, uh, in, in my own clinical practice, I see this question brought up many times. I'll have a patient, for example, come into my office and I'll have some, some type of chronic autoimmune disease and they want to you know, really implement a diet and lifestyle approach to try, to try to mitigate and calm down their, their autoimmune disease inflammation or expression. And you know, they go, what do you think about breast implants? And, and the question is, from a very basic model, if you have an autoimmune illness, if you have any kind of chronic inflammatory illness, having an increased chemical load is never a good idea. So that's one thing. The second thing, though, is it, it really is such a, such a sure. It is really such a personal uh, personal issue for some people. It's a sense of self. For some people, um, they've associated with the breast implants and who they are. So it's it's a pretty complex situation. And each person has their um, you know own psychological needs, their own sense of self, their own uh, value of uh, risk factors, so uh, it really is up to the patient. For the most part, uh, you know, I, I personally believe you shouldn't, you shouldn't put extra chemicals in your body no matter what, uh, unless you absolutely have to. So uh, that being said, let's talk about what do you do, what are the options if you have it, um, do you, should you remove it or not remove it again, that's going to be a personal call. But I would definitely say if you have chronic fatigue issues and exhaustion, then that should be an issue. Now the problem happens is when patients then start going online and they go to all these different forums and they're seeing all different types of responses. So let me give you some examples. One type of response is, you know, I've had breast implants, I've had it removed and it didn't do anything for me. I didn't feel any better or I actually felt worse. Another response is, oh, I immediately felt better. Rainbows came out, everything was better as soon as I had them removed. That's another response. Um, another response is, um, initially felt better, but then I was kind of back to my symptoms a year or two later. So let's talk about these and, and let's kind of talk about this the really important concept, which is um, what we call uh, immunological tolerance. And we've talked about immunological tolerance before. In uh, immunological tolerance is really our body's our immune system's ability to have a proportional response to some kind of antigen, whether the antigen is a pathogen like a virus or bacteria, or whether the antigen is a chemical. So, uh, you know, breast, Im breast implants significantly increase a chemical load to the body um, that's been reported and well understood. And then those chemicals may cause reactions for some people and they may not. So there's this concept of what's called chemical tolerance, which is how you react or may not react to chemicals. And all of us may have had different experiences where our chemical tolerance may be uh, different at different times. So, for example, um, you may have noticed a time in your life where you were extremely sensitive to cigarette smoke. Maybe you, maybe you were flying in a long airplane trip and then you got into a, an old, I don't know, hotel room that was kind of moldy and you were just tired and exhausted and you're breathing in some, let's say, mold spores. And all of a sudden you go outside and you sit at a restaurant and someone's smoking and then that smoke really bothers you that day and you've never noticed it before. So your immune tolerance is dynamic. It can change. Uh, over time, just like your general immune system can change over time. So your immune tolerance has a lot to do with how you react to certain chemicals. Now for some people, they have really intact and healthy immune tolerances. They 
um, have a very high antioxidant producing system. They have a diet that really promotes a lot of superfoods and their physiology <clears throat> is set in such a way where their, the, their liver uh, biotransformation pathways or detoxification pathways that clear chemicals are very efficient, their microbiome is healthy, and they can handle a lot of chemicals before they really have any adverse effects. Now, you take another person, maybe genetically they don't have optimization of clearing out some of the chemicals, um, you know, uh, like uh, PVCs or tolines or benzenes that are in, in breast implants just genetically, they're efficient in that, in that pathway. And in, com in combination with that, maybe they, they have a lot of inflammation. Maybe they have celiac disease or they have chronic inflammatory disease or some kind of inflammatory bowel syndrome. And then those chronic inflammatory states start to deplete their antioxidants. And the combination of genetically not being able to clear some of the chemicals that are in breast implants with being a chronically inflamed state with antioxidant depletion lowers their immune tolerance. So then they may have a reaction to a breast implant where some else may not, excuse me. <coughs> so those are, those are some of the variables and factors. So th it's, it's gonna be different for each person. So that's one of the key things which is very frustrating for patients because it's, it's, it's not black or white. It's just not the implant itself. It's your immune system's tolerance and its fitness in combination with the chemical. And your immune fitness is based on your genes and how you can metabolize certain chemicals and how effective your immune system is and your immune tolerance system is, plus environment that expresses those genes to turn on in a good way or in a negative way, and then in combination with the implant. Now, some patients um, maybe uh, may have some degree of healthy immune tolerance when they first put on their implants, but it, five or 10 years go by and they develop an autoimmune disease, and now um, the breast implants can really be a problem for them. They immediately take the breast implants out. They feel their inflammatory load goes down, but they still have an autoimmune disease. So they kind of go back to some of their old symptoms. So that's a scenario in which um, breast implants had a part, a, a role to play, but just removing doesn't necessarily cure or reverse the autoimmune disease. And that's the other key concept. Once you develop an autoimmune disease and the genes turn on to, to attack your own body, um, removing implants, removing the trigger doesn't necessarily reverse the autoimmune disease. Other factors now can also turn on the expression of the autoimmune disease, whether it's stress or lack of sleep or um, certain food proteins or different types of environmental triggers. And uh, it's not just so solely the breast implant, which is very frustrating because some, some, women that, some women that really do have breast illness syndrome and have some reactions to it, they're hoping when that they get rid of their breast implant that all their symptoms should go away. But that's also not the case, is that the immune system can change the point where you develop an autoimmune disease. And for a patient suffering from breast illness syndrome, what you have to understand is, if you suspect that it's causing some chemical immune reaction for you, there's a point, if you cross over to the development of an autoimmune disease, even when you take it out, um, you now have an autoimmune disease. Now, the time period from where you have um, no autoimmune disease to you develop autoimmune disease is, is gonna be triggered by various factors. Obviously having a chemical load may be one of those factors, um, again, based on your gene type and your environment. So that being said, those are all the areas of confusion that we have with um, these chemical reactions. Now, the other key thing is, well, can't we just measure these chemicals in blood? And if they're high, then we remove them. And that's not how this will, that would be a good theory, but that's not really how these things work. Some of these chemicals uh, go right into tissues, then they cannot be measured. Uh, and then they still have immune inf impacts. Some of these get stuck into the lymphatic system and they cause immune dysregulation at very trace levels that uh, labs aren't sensitive to pick up on. So we can't just look at measuring these chemicals in the blood. Um, and that's one factor. As far as measuring immune tolerance, the, there really isn't a very good test to measure immune tolerance. Immune tolerance is a bunch of different immune cells that can dysfunction, whether it's like T-reg cells or dendritic cells and they can dysfunction at a local tissue level and not really represent a complete blood draw. However, sometimes you can see changes in things like regulatory T cells on blood draws. And for most people that have lost their immune tolerance, their white blood cell tests on immune panels are gonna to be totally normal. They're not gonna show some of these subtle dysregulation pathways. So usually with the blood test, all you're really measuring is quantity, how much of one immune cell is, there, is of the other, but not how well they're functioning. So when people lose their immune tolerance, they don't lose the quantity of their immune cells, 
they just uh, they just don't function the way they, they need to. And, and and routine blood work does not measure that. So that's one of the frustrations. These are things that are measured in a clinical laboratory um, um, a scenario where they can they can look at these cells individually with a microscope and do some analysis. So those are the those are the areas of frustration with it. Now um, I would say I would say so. People go, well, what would you do? This is the common question again. My practice do when I work with patients. My questions, my answer is always, I would remove them. <laughs> if I if I have a, if I ever suffered from a chronic illness or had any issues, I would remove them. And second question, would you ever put them in? Absolutely not. <laughs> but you have to understand, I'm extremely um, ex I'm extremely biased by working with chronic disease patients for many years. So it's like you don't want any other additional factors that can make someone sick. Um, now, for some people, um, I don't. I, you know, some people do have some degree of Im healthy immune integrity and immune fitness, where they don't really have any health problems for it. Those people do exist, uh, just like with any kind of illness and any kind of chemical exposure. There's people who smoke cigars <laughs> until they're 100, uh, and they still are okay. So there's obviously exceptions to this, but when you're at the point where you're ill or at the point where you're chronically inflamed and your point where you're sick you don't or you have those illnesses like autoimmune disease in your family history you really don't want to play this game now um the other thing i would also recommend is is if someone has breast illness syndrome to get involved with support groups and you know kind of figure this out and uh have a community to help because uh it's you know it's a challenging issue and you know for a lot of people um uh, that really does make a big difference for them. Now, as far as immune tolerance goes, let me explain another thing. If you have breast illness syndrome, you can't just take a bunch of supplements to support your immune system and think that it's going to be enough. So you can't, for example, just detox all the time and assume that the breast, uh, the chemicals in the breast implants are not going to cause a problem. Um, there really is only one option if you really think that these that these chemicals in breast implants are causing some illness, and that's basically removal. Now, things you can do to improve your immune tolerance, and, and we do have a course that I put together um, on our website, drknews.com. It's the Oral Tolerance Program, and I give you a detailed explanation of ways and things you can do to improve your immune system tolerance, but I'm going to share some of the key concepts with you right now. So one of them is, you know, for example, you have to have... <coughs> A healthy microbiome. Your gut's gonna has to be healthy. You want to have lots of gastrointestinal diversity. You know, very basic things like making sure your vitamin D levels are uh, up to normal are really important. Making sure you have healthy amounts of antioxidants are really critical to improving your immune tolerance. Making sure you don't have intestinal permeability or leaky gut is another factor that's really important to to make sure that your immune system is not overzealous. So, you know, those are. I mean, the very basics uh, of, of it. As far as supplements, people always ask about supplements and nutritional supplements. At the, you know, when you look at immune tolerance, things like vitamin D, vitamin A are really important. Um, prebiotics can be very helpful. Um, short chain fatty acids like butyrate can be very helpful. If you think you have a leaky gut, things like glutamine can be very helpful. Again, these are just some, some general recommendations uh, of those things. So, anyways, um, I think we're going to get into questions here in a second, um, but those are the the main things about toxic chemicals. Now, I, was, I would also say all these same principles that we're talking about with breast implants pretty much translate to people that have mercury amalgam fillings. It's the same thing. If you have chemicals in your body that increases your chemical load, and amalgam fillings have known toxic substances in them, and then those toxic substances. Um, do play a role in uh, increasing chemical load and potentially causing inflammation. So, um, and for some people, they have they don't notice any significant differences. And you know, the 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 key issue though is, why would you ever put a substance that's known as a toxic chemical into your body long term? I think that's pretty much obvious for most people that they would not do that. So uh, now that's great, they have different ceramics and different composites that are much healthier if you do need to do some dental work or, or, or even with different types of uh, hip replacement surgery, they're using um, much more, much more uh, safe, uh, less toxic uh, compounds. All right, so let me go through and uh, go through some of these things here. 
So one of the questions that I see here from Danielle is, you said you, you lose your immune tolerance and your immune system becomes hypervigilant. Can you fully recover from this? Well, that's again, not, not everyone that has um, um, breast implant syndrome or illness is gonna recover and we don't know why. One of it is, I think the most common reason is some actually do develop autoimmune disease and when they remove them, uh, sorry, I forgot chair. I can't lie. <laughs> Here. <laughs> okay. So um, if, 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 some people, if, if you have developed an autoimmune disease, then even when you remove them, the autoimmune disease is still going to be there. So autoimmune diseases, for example, can be triggered, you know, you can have the genes and, and, and uh, post the third trimester in pregnancy, your autoimmune disease can turn on. For example, the most common one is Hashimoto's. And then, you know, once you give birth, you still have the autoimmune disease. It's not like you can go back and reverse that. There's a certain chemical load where immune system dysfunction takes place and genes turn on. That's the thing. These genes turn on. And, and unfortunately, we don't really know how to turn them off with uh, drugs, diet, nutritional lifestyle yet. All you can do is decrease the expression of them once they develop. So, <laughs> so those, are, those are the variables that are involved with how does a person respond if they're healthy or not healthy. And, sorry. And uh, it's sorry there. <laughs> So those are those are the the things to think about. Um, but this shouldn't deter you from, for example, uh, removing them because you still want to decrease your environmental uh, chemical load as much as possible. So okay, that was a question there. I think I turned my mic up. I mean, next to my mouth here <laughs> a little bit more. All right. Any other questions? Oh yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. All right, Danielle. Once you lose oral tolerance and immune system becomes hypervigilant, can you ever recover from We just answered that. I was getting a chair, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Well, good job. Um, Mandy, I got Hashimoto's after implants. Also did heavy, uh, heavy metal chelation with breast implants still in. I got much more sick. Rashes, inflammation, and brain issues increased. Metals pulled out of implants went systemic. Will you speak to this? I want doctors prescribing chelators to be informed. Yes, actually, you just brought up a good point. I, had, I need to do a talk on chelation and uh, some of the research on chelation as well. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, here's the interesting thing. The toxic compounds that are in breast implants, they're compounds that your body can can clear through the liver. So let me explain something. There's two different types of chemicals for the most part. There's toxic pollutants and chemicals which your body can clear through the liver. These are bio, they call them biotransfer uh, chemicals that can go through biotransformation. Um, and then there's chemicals your body cannot biotransform. They cannot get rid of them through the liver and renal pathways. And those the best example of those are like heavy metals, things like lead, things like mercury. Your your liver just can't metabolize get rid of, get rid of them, and that's where chelation comes in. So, um, chelation isn't really there to remove any of these chemicals. Uh, you don't need chelation to remove any of the chemicals that are known toxins in breast implants. Things like benzenes, things like acetones, uh, things like epoxy resins, um, things like phenyl compounds. Those your liver can metabolize. Your microbiome and your liver can metabolize on its own if, it, if it's healthy. So, um, with the exception of maybe a little bit of lead, um, compounds in, in, in some, some breast implants, uh, the rest of it your body can biotransform. So you're not going to get rid of these like breast implant things through chelation. There is unquestionably a large degree of physicians out there that are on this chelation money tree and I don't know how to explain it and be direct any other way. You walk in, there's one thing that's guaranteed. You have ML toxicity and you need chelation. Um, it is a group that I totally am disgusted with. It's a group that um, needs needs some needs to be called up on what they're doing um, it's not everyone can handle chelation people that are very sick people that have blood brain barrier impeachments people that have gut barrier impeachments people that have chronic autoimmune diseases they can absolutely for sure get worse when they go through chelation therapy and, and <clears throat> there are studies that show that chelating compounds like DD, DMPS, EDTA, DMSA do, do redistribute chemicals to other tissues so Someone who's done their PhD in concentrations in immunology and toxicology, I can tell you it is a real issue. Uh, and uh, I think we'll do a talk on that at some point. So if you're telling me that 
you've gone, you had Hashimoto's and then you had dental implants, which, which we probably would need some chelation to get rid of those. But are you healthy enough to handle chelation is another key thing. So I think we'll have to do an individual talk with that. But it sounds like, you know, since you have autoimmune disease, you, or your tolerance is dysregulated and then you really weren't immunologically fit enough to handle that extra chemical load and you had a flare up. So that also happens all the time. So be very, very careful. And I would say, if you're worried about the toxic chemical compounds in breast implants, you don't, almost all those chemical compounds do not need chelation to be metabolized. They just need a healthy um, microbiome. So lots of healthy bacteria diversity in the microbiome, healthy detox pathways. So you need lots of and acetylcysteine, sulfur amino acids. Um, you can even take things to upregulate your liver enzymes like uh, uh, milk thistle, which is very popular um, to really support those pathways. Okay. Okay. Um, someone's also, Christi Christine is asking, are dental implants also an issue? Right, so dental implants are also an issue. They're just the same concept. You're, you're exposing your body to a chemical. Um, now there's a difference between them. Dental implants have actually heavy metal toxic chemicals your body cannot metabolize normally. Uh, and this is where you may have to consider well, dental removal by a trained um, biological dentist mm -hmm. that can use vacuums and dams to make sure you don't get exposed to a lot of vapors. You can make sure you're actually healthy and fit before you go through the process. And uh, um, also trying to improve your immune tolerance. Okay. Okay, Sandy's asking, what about MTHFR? How does that play into breast illness syndrome and detox? So MTHFR is a genetic uniqueness that about 20 to 25% of the U.S. population, worldwide population have, in which they need more methyl donors. And methyl donors, for the, for the most part, just think of things like B12 and folic acid. They need more B12 and folic acid to allow their body to um, methylate. And methylate is just a term that means a carbon, one carbon group attaches to a chemical, and when that one carbon group attaches to the chemical, it changes that structure of the chemical, and this is really important for detoxification because once the chemical gets methylated, it becomes water soluble, and then you can eliminate it through urine, feces, and sweat. So for some people, and it's 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 one of them, it's the most common genetic uniqueness, or what they call single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphism that the Human Genome Project found. They really need higher amounts of B12 and folate than, than most people. And they're way above the, the RDA guidelines for needing B12 and folate. And usually when this, this, this is not working, if they do a blood test, they can see something called homocysteine elevated because homocysteine is, is, a, is an amino acid that is totally dependent upon methylation pathways. So if someone's methylation pathways aren't working, they would have a high homocysteine. And if they have a high homocysteine, that also means that they don't have enough methylation support not only to break down homocysteine, which is normally amino acid in the body, but it's also very inflammatory. But it's it's they don't have enough methylation probably to get rid of chemicals and toxins. So there are some of the of the many chemicals that uh, are found in breast implants. Many of those chemicals depend upon methylation for clearance. So if you have a high homocysteine, that means you don't have enough methyl donors. That also means you may not have enough methyl um, B12 folate compounds to help support your liver's pathways to clear out some of these chemicals. So uh, you definitely want to increase your folate in B12. Some people have to take what's called tetrahydrofolate, which is a supplement that um, bypasses that genetic uniqueness. Um, and these are so popular now, you can find them at any health food store. But uh, that is a mechanism that, that you brought up. So thank you. Okay, Evelyn's asking or saying, I had breast implants for 15 years and was fine, then developed Hashimoto's. I had them removed, however, I still have antibodies. Should I not reimplant? You should not reimplant. <laughs> if you have an autoimmune disease, uh, do not add your chemical load in. Um, it's just not worth it. Um, do not. I'm just giving you my advice. <laughs> And I, I think people are unclear about, well, if I have them removed, but I still have antibodies. Well, yeah. Well, first of all, once you have Hashimoto's antibodies, your antibodies are going to fluctuate all throughout the day. It's not going to be directly related to breast implants. It'll be related to a whole host of factors. It could be related to um, anything that impacts your immune system as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's not specific for just breast implants. So they can fluctuate up and down based on how aggressive your B cell response is with the autoimmunity. But to take someone who's got an autoimmune disease, which means they've already lost tolerance, 
and then include in an, a chemical load that's going to tax their antioxidant system and their tolerance is never a good idea. Okay. Um, sorry. Someone's asking me about root canals. Root canals. Yeah. Well, any kind of dental work, you know, sometimes sometimes you have to clean up a root canal to get rid of a pathogen and infection, the bacteria, to really regain your health. So, um, you know, at some point, listen, we all get exposed to chemicals, even if we don't have them in our body, and we have to have some degree of chemical immune tolerance to be able to um, stay healthy and not develop chronic illnesses and especially autoimmune diseases. Okay, Christina's saying, um, I've had implants that are 16 years old. Mm -hmm. I have been diagnosed with MCAS and CIRS. I had silver fillings removed in the late 90s and amalgams removed three years ago. Detox, chelation, and treatment for mold and metals has only made things worse. Exactly. My neuro symptoms have become chronic. Exactly. What do you advise? This is exactly the point. Yeah. When you have chronic autoimmune diseases, let's say you do have a mold illness, when you have um, an autoimmune disease and you get to the point where your immune system is totally dysregulating, so now you have mast cell activation syndrome and you have a hypersensitive immune response, um, chelation can make you worse. Um, and you have to have some degree of fitness in order to help with chelation. The best strategy I can I can share with you is what I've always what I've always shared is to try to improve your immune tolerance. Um, again, we have an immune tolerance program at Dr. K News. You can check that out. The key concepts are really diversify your gut, get things like vitamin D going, make sure you have intestinal repair, make sure you have high amounts of antioxidants, um, raise your glutathione levels, things like N-acetylcysteine help do that. But it doesn't cure or reverse it, so that's one of the key things. Like if you try to improve your immune tolerance and go, well, I still have an autoimmune disease that didn't work, you're really thinking the wrong way. Um, so just so you know, there, there's never been, there's no known cure of an autoimmune disease, okay? And here's the thing, there's no known cures of cancer. There's published cancer cures of cancer that have been documented in the literature. There's no really no known cures of autoimmune disease. It is absolutely classified as an incurable condition. And people sometimes confuse what's called remission where they feel like they don't have an autoimmune disease and lab markers go down as cure, but it's not really cure because people that have remission, they tend to flare up by triggers when they are monitored over a period of time. So there's no known cure for autoimmune disease. The key thing with an autoimmune disease is once it develops is to not let it express as much as it can. Mm -hmm. The greater the autoimmune disease is expresses, the more tissue inflammation destruction is going to take place. If it's rheumatoid arthritis, it's going to mean more joint swelling inflammation. If it's Hashimoto's, it's going to mean more thyroid gland destruction. So it really depends on where the autoimmunity is. But overall, depending where the autoimmune disease is, general inflammation is going to um, really cause someone to be unhealthy and have lots of symptoms and promote other diseases like cardiovascular disease and um, neurodegenerative diseases. So. Um, you know, autoimmune disease is, 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 is the big deal, it's different. And if you have an autoimmune disease, you got to be very careful with uh, chelation. Okay. Um, so someone's asking the relationship between this and neurological symptoms as well. Watch your speaker on my... Okay. Between neurological symptoms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with neurological symptoms, there's a few things. So some people that have any kind of chemical insult, whether it's the chemicals from breast implants or from other chemicals, they do develop neurological autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. and, and many neurological autoimmune diseases get, get uh, undiagnosed um, because they're not severe enough. So um, the most common, for example, neurological autoimmune disease is multiple sclerosis. And for multiple sclerosis, you have to have significant injury to areas of the brain and spinal cord where you have scarring of the tissue and then they can measure the amount of scarring and lesions, and then if you have enough of them, you can get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Well, many, many people um, have neurological autoimmunity measured by antibodies to their brain, to proteins like myelin and other tissue proteins, but never develop full-blown multiple sclerosis. Um, they don't progress to that level. So they have these autoimmune reactions that are taking place, which are known in the immunology literature as not autoimmune disease, but autoimmune reactivity. So that means they have blood work that shows their immune system is reacting to their own tissue, but it hasn't destroyed enough of their tissue where they get a disease. 
So I think for a lot of people that have some of these significant neurological symptoms of breast illness syndrome, they may have neurological autoimmune reactivity. Now that can be measured. Uh, the most common proteins to check are antibodies for something called myelin basic protein and my, myelin uh, oligodendrocyte protein. MBP and MOG, all conventional laboratories run it. So if those are elevated, that means that you have some um, neurological autoimmune reactivity, even if, uh, if your MRIs are normal. That can eventually progress to MS in some people, but for many people, it's just an ongoing neurological inflammatory reaction. For other people, the breast implants doesn't cause neurological autoimmune disease, it just causes inflammation, and that inflammation shuts down the brain. And when the brain's inflamed, it doesn't function well. So uh, it doesn't produce energy very well. So people have very poor brain endurance. So everything that, used, that, that involves brain function, like driving or reading, causes them to be fatigued. When there's brain inflammation, uh, synaptic activity is impaired, which means neurons don't uh, can fire into each other as fast as they normally do. So the brain kind of slows down. So people notice a brain fog, a depression, brain fatigue from just inflammation. That doesn't have to be neurological autoimmune disease. So that can happen with any kind of chemical load as well. Okay. Marvi is saying, can you detox through using niacin and sauna and nutrients like glutathione and binders to detox, what's BLL, breast? Breast, breast illness syndrome. What is it? Yeah, I don't know what BLL is. Um, breast okay. implant. Breast implant illness, illness, yeah. BII, sorry. Um, I'll say it again. Can you detox through using niacin and sauna and nutrients like glutathione and binders to detox BII after you remove the implants? Right, so it depends. So here's your question. It depends who, you, who you're asking that question to. If you answer it to a toxicology scientist, they're going to say, well, no, well, there's no research showing that, and that's true. Um, physiologically, uh, in a naturopathic model, natural medicine model, the answer would be absolutely. You want to sweat. You want to optimize your biotransformation pathways. So you make a different answer based on who you ask, and, and, and the researcher is right, and the, the person who practices naturopathic medicine is practicing basic philosophies of physiology, which is if you have a toxic load, you need to take compounds to support biotransformation, and you need to encourage things like sweating and, and urination and bowel movements. That's just normal toxicology of human beings. So um, I would say it's always a good idea to do those kind of strategies, to um, to, to really encourage sweating, to really encourage um, supporting your liver pathways with supplements. Uh, N-acetylcysteine is a very good one. Milk thistle is very good. Um, niacin this is going to really just cause more flushing. I don't know if it's going to have a significant impact necessarily on uh, getting rid of chemicals, but it may make you feel like you were because you're flushing a lot. Uh, but it, you know, they're all probably good ideas to consider. And they're not going to hurt you. And if anything, you'll probably feel really good doing it. <laughs> Okay, a lot of people are asking, what do you recommend after having them removed? Any kind of nutritional protocol you can think of, or that would be a generalized after you have breast implants Okay, removed? so after you have breast implants removed, the, the key thing is basically what was just mentioned. Really encourage your body's own natural um, detoxification pathways. So detoxification means you have several things take place. You gotta take a chemical that is so the chemicals, for example, mercury, uh, the, some of the chemicals that are found in uh, breast implants, like acetone and benzene rings and different epoxy resins and so forth, they can be metabolized in the liver. So you want to make sure your liver has lots of uh, flavonoids in, and it goes through what's called the phase one, phase two pathway. So just basic things like having B vitamins, having things like N-acetylcysteine to raise glutathione, um, taking things like milk thistle to support phase one, phase two pathways. Um, you know, nowadays there's, uh, if you go to any health food store, they have like detox supplements, with, which has like a combination of all those ingredients in there. And they're just basic nutrients that support the liver pathways. Then you can also encourage having a healthy bowel movements. Like you have to have regular bowel movements to be able to eliminate toxic chemicals. So if you're constipated, that needs to be addressed. Your gallbladder has to contract to, to get rid of compounds your liver has metabolized. You have to have a healthy gallbladder. And then sweating is always a good idea. So just the basics. Okay. Um, people are saying please do a chelation talk. Yeah, we're going to do a chelation talk. Yeah. And uh, um, what are your thoughts on blood type diet 
for working on gut health if you're trying to heal the gut. Blood type diet. Well, um, okay. So there's definitely different. I mean, in the peer review literature, in the immunology literature, there's definitely different types of blood types that make a person at risk for various infections and various diseases. So we know that. Um, even with recent COVID-19, they're finding um, blood type O's may not react as severely um, as other blood types. But I think there's been a um, the blood type diet. I think is a huge jump. Some people make some changes in it, they feel better. But for the most part, it's still, I think it, the evidence is here. It's like, ooh, they jumped way too far, <laughs> too far with it. Um, and the argument to that is someone saying, well, you know, I changed my diet for my blood type, my whole life changed, so I felt better. That's great. That does happen for some people. But I think uh, for me personally, it was too big of a jump. So I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not like, uh, I don't think the blood type diet it would be your most efficient way to fix your gut. I think you just look, look at strategies to fix your gut directly um, as a way. But uh, you know, a lot of times when you're just sick and chronic, trial and error is the only way to do things. And if you're excited by trying it and you want to give it a go, it's not going to hurt you. <laughs> so it may even help you. Okay. Yael is saying, any links to fibromyalgia with breast implant? Yeah. So fibromyalgia is linked with any kind of chemical load. It's not just breast implants for breast, uh, you know, um, breast implant illness. So um, fibromyalgia, basically, you have mitochondrial failure. The mitochondria, your energy powerhouse cells, and the mitochondria uh, are found in muscles. They're found in the brain. They're found in tissues, and anything that uncouples mitochondria, which makes means your makes your energy, your cells, powerhouse cells, not make energy as efficiently, will lead to symptoms like fibromyalgia, like chronic muscle pain and knots and trigger points all over and fatigue and malaise and all those things that go along with fibromyalgia. So um, chemical toxicity symptoms match fibromyalgia symptoms. And then there's, you know, as, as you know, uh, it's, it's a general diagnostic term that's thrown out all over the place when people actually have underlying causes of their physiology being impaired. Okay, Maria, what are your thoughts on replacing fat from another part of the body to fill in the breast after removal of implants. Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't. I can say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than a chemical implant. Uh, what? I don't know. That that might seem like a better option if it's your own, if it's your own tissue being redistributed. I don't know what the, I, I can't really comment because I don't know much about it, that at least it's not a chemical <laughs> exposure. Right. Hmm. Um, a little off topic. Can untreated thyroid disease cause psychosis? Yes. Untreated thyroid disease absolutely can cause psychosis. Uh, but, I mean, it's got to get progressed and severe enough, um, but it does. It, it, you know, thyroid hormones are necessary for synaptic transmission in the brain and for just brain metabolism and brain function. So people could get all types of psychosis with long-term um, thyroid disease, but uh, it is actually still pretty rare. I mean, you have to have some severe um, thyroid deficiency for a long period of time in combination with having some degree of susceptibility for psychosis. I think the combination of two are, are necessary. I mean, there's lots of people that are walking around with hypothyroidism for 10, 20 years, never diagnosed and don't have psychosis. So it's not just the thyroid hormone deficiency by itself, but clearly there's there is some links between that in the published in the literature. Okay, um, from Elaine. They say titanium is fairly benign, but have you seen it triggering reactions and joint pain and swelling? So I think for me, um, again, I'm not an expert in, in all the different surgical implants and there isn't a lot of studies being done. I think titanium is one of the less benign ones because the key things with the chemicals that are a problem is if they break down and if they get released in body tissues. So when you look at that, you're looking at the acidity and the pH of the body. Certain chemicals can get released into the tissues very, very quickly. Over time, they can start to leak and break down. Whereas titanium, it doesn't do that. So I will like, say, for example, myself, if I needed a hip replacement, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be so concerned with a titanium replacement <laughs> hip um, as an option just because the titanium is so resistant to breakdown in the pH of the body. But, you know, titanium is never pure titanium. There's different metals that are part of the titanium mix. 
like there's a little bit of copper there's a little bit of um, other other metals that are involved with it um, and for some people those other metals may be may be factored but surgical grade titanium has very very little amounts of those other chemical ingredients but it would depend on how sensitive you are okay um very informative thank you okay can you do a session on hyperthyroid hyperthyroid well, hyperthyroid is like 1%. So I'm afraid of some of the topics, I'm afraid like we might have five people show up for the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I'm trying to uh, pick more really broad topics. We can certainly do one on thyroid and discuss hyper as part of it. But uh, Did you do a thyroid talk? I don't know. I can't remember. We'll have to look. <laughs> We're getting old. I know. Um, <laughs> can a surgery on a face cause an autoimmune disease? So there have been links with uh, autoimmune diseases being triggered after surgery or trauma. Oh. So um, whether it's a traumatic brain injury, whether it's a car, motor, vehicle accident, whether it's a, a various benign surgical procedure, um, it does increase the inflammatory physiological stress response. I tend to think it's not gonna it's not gonna cause it by itself like you have to have some susceptibility or maybe you had an under an autoimmune disease that was there but it wasn't expressed as much but there's certainly um, um, case reports and understandings that you can't have trauma induced autoimmunity including surgery okay Shane is asking is psoriasis really an autoimmune condition is it an attack on one of the Krebs cycle intermediates, thus they use fumaric acid supplements in Europe. Psoriasis. So psoriasis is, a, is an autoimmune disease for, for the sake that there's an inflammatory reaction against the skin representative of an autoimmune disease with histological studies. They haven't identified the specific target protein that causes it. So that's why you can't like get a blood test and go, oh, you have psoriasis, you have this antibody. So that hasn't been established yet. There's lots of autoimmune diseases that exist that they haven't found the target autoimmune protein they can measure in blood for the diagnosis. Um, and psoriasis is one of them. So I'm not sure about the application that you're, you're discussing um, or if that if they're, the assumption that that's the only mechanism is accurate. So that's best they can do to answer that one. Okay. Um, Sean. Is the primary problem with implants a foreign object in the body, regardless of the material, or, sorry, uh, sorry, or the toxicity of the material itself? For example, are implants made of 100% ceramic for knee, hip, dental more acceptable? Yeah. Again, so the key thing is that the certain materials where we're finding certain materials are less resistant to break down and breach into to the body, into the tissues. Thing is, ceramic and titanium being the, the more popular items now because they don't have um, any of the chemicals leach into the system. Breast implants, on, on the other hand, and then if you look at ceramic and titanium, they're extremely dense, they're extremely hard, and they're extremely resistant to break down from just you know pH of uh, bodily tissues and from the immune system. Like you can have white blood cells chew on titanium all day; it's not going to break down. <laughs> Whereas you look at breast implants, they're plastic, um, they're soft, and so those the, the, the chemical composition of the implants have chemicals in them that can easily break down in bodily systems. So it's, just, it's not just that something is put into the body, it's that something's put in the body that has the ability to then have chemicals leach into bodily tissues. That's one of the key factors. Okay. Asa? ASYA, it's pretty. Do Botox injections affect our immune system or brain function? Yes, there is a, <clears throat> there was actually one study, so I can't say extensively, it's one well proven. There was one study that did show that Botox turns on Hashimoto's. Really? Yeah, the Botox, the, the, the toxin in botulinum, they looked at it and they saw flare-ups of Hashimoto's right after injection. And they actually found that the, they actually did an amino acid sequence of the botulin toxin that's used in Botox, they found that it had amino acid similarity with TPO, and they they concluded that there may be some molecular mimicry mechanisms that are involved with it. 
So that's the only one with Botox and autoimmune disease so far published. It was a very small study, but it was well done. And I did do the amino acid sequence breakdown to kind of show that the possibility is there. So... How do you know that? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Linda's asking, is Parkinson's an autoimmune disease? Okay, so Parkinson's disease is cons considered an alpha-synucleinopathy, which means that there's a buildup of protein called alpha-synuclein. And that gets in the way of healthy neurons and um, leads to the neurons that aren't getting input to slowly degenerate, just like if your muscle wasn't contracting, it would slowly degenerate. So this alpha-synuclein protein builds up and gets in the way of healthy neurons and they start to degenerate. And it happens in the olfactory bulb first, then in the gut, then eventually goes into areas of the basic ganglia that involve doping pathways and people start to get tremors and rigidity and stiffness. There is some research that shows that auto Parkinson's disease and even dementia and Alzheimer's may have an autoimmune component to it. So it's not just that this, pro they call it protein aggregate where these proteins build up, it's not just the protein aggregate by itself. And they have been using a biomarker called alpha-synuclein antibodies to measure this. And we published a paper uh, uh, in a, what was the journal? It was the journal, is the journal Toxics. Um, where we looked at patients that had Parkinson's disease and measured their bisphenol A antibodies and compared them to alpha synuclein antibodies to see if plastics may have a role in this neurological model of Parkinson's autoimmune disease. And we found that there was significant risk, sometimes four to five fold increased risk, or if you start to react against plastic bottles because you lose your tolerance, then you may also start to have the biomarker for uh, autoimmune reactivity in Parkinson's. And uh, so I believe uh, there is an autoimmune component to Parkinson's disease, but for the most part, it's still considered a protein aggregation disorder where proteins stick together um, and al what are called alpha synuclein and Lewy bodies. Okay, um, Christina's making a comment of they, they use Botox for migraines every 12 weeks. Yeah. People inject Botox for migraines, yeah. It does work. But, yeah. but you know, ultimately, this, this is the key concept. You don't have migraines because you have Botox Botox deficiency, you have migraines because there's something wrong with your health and your physiology. Um, you got to figure out what that is. So that's why you would need to either figure out yourself or work with a good functional medicine practitioner um, to really get down to the root cause or someone who's really good at lifestyle, diet, nutrition management to really figure out what the, the key is because it's just uh, you're having some kind of autonomic dysfunction, vascular dynamics that are impaired. Could be hormonal, could be immune based, um, but uh, you know, you don't want to keep giving yourself a toxin. Okay. And can someone develop an autoimmune disease even if they are not genetically predisposed? Well, when we say gen genetically predisposed, it's pretty clear that there's a genetic predisposition there. However, it's not one gene. It seems to be a cluster of genes. Um, so that's one of the other key factors. They're not finding, for example, only one gene will determine if you have Hashimoto's. They're finding is that there's a cluster of genes that are involved. So, however, the, the way they look at these is they do what are called twin studies, where they look to see the rates of developing autoimmune disease between t twins that are in different environments. And there is this strong uh, genetic uh, potential there. So the current theory is there is genetic susceptibility as a key factor in developing autoimmune disease. The problem is we don't know what all the genes are for each of the autoimmune diseases, and not everyone's getting all the genes tested. So I think it's going to take a period of time to really fall, confirm that, that. But at, at this point, everyone is in, the, is in agreement that there's a genetic um, uniqueness involved. And there's different types of gene uniquenesses for the same disease. So not everyone has Hashimoto's with the same dysfunctional genes. So that's how complex the, the question, the investigation is for it. Yeah. Okay, Jesse's asking, is it okay to take quercetin daily until you get to the root cause of a, yes. just a scalp itching? Yes. And then doing some Cyrex testing as well. Yes. If you have, like quercetin is such a very powerful natural antihistamine supplement. Mm -hmm. And if you have chronic histamine reactions, um, whether for you it's scalp, scalp, itchy, scalp itching. Yeah, you can use it all the time. Of course, 10 is a natural flavonoid. You can take it every day. Preventively, it'd be, it's great. It's just like, you know, it's flavonoids found in orange, like in orange peels and lemon peels. Um, that'd be a good idea to take every day just for your own health. 
It's helping you great. Um, do you know what HPU is? No. Okay, someone's asking about HPU. They're going to try to spell it out. I don't know yeah. what that stands for. We're so bad with initials. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know any initials. Very. I know a few. Just... <laughs> IBS, inflammatory bowel syndrome. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, Sean's asking if you do a talk on low T3 syndrome. Sure. Uh, so... We should do a talk just on general thyroid imbalances. And maybe do we talk about hyper and T3 and all that as well? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, sorry, I had a question here. Dun, dun, dun. So someone is very kindly saying that your eyes light up when I walk in the room. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Wow, that's so nice. Thank you. I'm going to go back and look. <laughs> By the way, thank you everyone for joining us and asking questions. It's really, it's, uh, you know, I, I, for me, it feels like I have a lot of information to share. It's nice to have people that actually want to listen to it. So, <laughs> you know, just sometimes staring at the ceiling alone, not feeling like I'm making any impact in the world. So it's nice to be able to, to do these. That's nice. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Off topic, but what's the number one thing you suggest for someone with MS? The Partner one, has, I'm sorry, DHA is gluten-free diet and low dose vitamin D. Like number one thing for multiple sclerosis. Yeah. So as you know, there's different types of multiple sclerosis. There's, there's progressive types, there's relapsing and remitting types, and there's different variations between those as well. Um, so there isn't generally like the one thing, but I would say you, you could easily start with, I mean, the most common things to start with is just vitamin D. Um, lots of research on vitamin D. Um, that's, that it may have an impact, um, and there's increased risk for people that are vitamin deficient for all autoimmune, for many autoimmune diseases, including MS. So vitamin D would be something to consider as just like a general baseline for not knowing anything about the patient, just the disease, which is, you know, not the most accurate way. And then I would strongly, strongly um, suggest being gluten and dairy free right away, uh, unrelated to celiac disease. And gluten and dairy are extremely inflammatory, proteins in general, uh, either whether a person has sensitivity to it or not, I would definitely do a gluten dairy free removal. And for some people that are, do have some of these genetic celiac genes, it can be a huge impact. Mm -hmm. um, there's a paper that we published in the scientific journal called Nutrients, I think it was in 2014 or 2016, where we took 400 healthy blood donor samples and we measured them against the autoimmune target protein of MS, which is myelin basic protein. and um, myelin oligodendrocyte, and we checked other neurological antibody proteins, uh, like GAT65 neurofilament, and we measured these 400 healthy blood donors with antibodies to milk proteins and wheat proteins. And what we found was that there was a significant uh, correlation association with those that had neurological antibodies uh, and to milk and wheat sensitivity. Um, and it was much more than the seven, less than 1%, less than 3% celiac sensitivity. So, and there's, so it's a gluten dairy free diet, vitamin D is the obvious no brainer place to, to just start with right away. Now, personalized lifestyle medicine approach is really what you need for any chronic autoimmune or inflammatory condition. Um, okay. And usually a good functional medicine practitioner, someone who does diet nutrition lifestyle can help you uh, navigate through some of that. Thank you. Okay, so someone's asking about if you can do talk about migraines. Sure. Um, and then they have a question about migraines. Okay. I noticed that taurine helps a lot. What could be happening with my brain? Can I be deficient for something if taurine's helping? You know, for, mo for most people, migraines, the only, the only single nutrient that's been shown directly associated with, with, with having a statistically significant impact in, in migraines in studies has been magnesium. So if you're going to try one supplement before any other, I would try magnesium. Um, and with magnesium, the other key thing is you got to make sure you're taking enough magnesium for what your body's needs are. Sometimes just taking 100 milligrams of magnesium is not going to be enough. So, for example, you have migraines and you take magnesium and go, hey, well, I took it for three days or took it for a week, didn't do anything. Or magnesium is already my multi supplement, so it can't be that. That's not the way to think. So, you, you really need to do what's called a magnesium load to determine how much body, how much magnesium your body needs. And the way to do that is to start with. So just, let's say, buy a magnesium supplement and then start with one capsule and each day increase the capsule dosage until you notice, so do it, let's say, anytime during the day or at nighttime, do it after, you know, after you eat or something. Like, let's say you have three capsules one day um, and the next day you have four. At some point, you're going to get 
enough magnesium where you have a watery bowel movement. So your first bowel will be really watery. You're not going to have, let's say, it runs all day, but you have a watery bowel movement. And that means you reach your magnesium saturation, so then you back off. So four capsules uh, from whatever you're using cause that, then go to three. Then stay on that dose for a couple weeks, see if that helps with your migraines. So that's where single nutrients go, that's the main one. Now taurine, taurine is one of the sulfur amino acids that's involved. Um, it's part of uh, an intermediate in the urea cycle. But I don't, when you just tell me that you're taking taurine, that it's helping you with it, doesn't doesn't uh, pop up any key specific pathway. Um, so I can't help you with the with taurine question as well. Okay, Okay. one yeah. last question? Um, sure. Or are we good? No, there's a couple. Okay. Um, but uh, here's a lot of people are just grateful for your talks, which oh, is really kind. Thank you. Okay, Chris is asking. Um, we talk about where the protein aggregation in Parkinson in Parkinson's comes from. Yeah. And are there enzymes we can activate to reduce the aggregation? No. The only thing you can do to reduce the aggregation of protein aggregates is to turn on a gene expression called mTOR pathways. And mTOR pathways have only been found to be expressed aggressive enough to change the buildups by fasting. And we've done some talks on fasting. So fasting turns on mTOR pathways that then helps what's called with autophagy, which is the pathway to clear out these proteins. There's no dietary supplement uh, that's been shown to do that. So it's really just fasting so far that seems to have the best impact on getting rid of some of these protein aggregation pathways. Okay, last one. Um, Keith. Does NAC have advantages over using cysteine? Why use NAC, which is, as far as I know, is not natural? Also, cysteine is much cheaper than NAC. You can absolutely absolutely use cysteine versus N-acetylcysteine. Um, the N-acetyl is a two-carbon group, so some people like to have the additional two carbons in addition, in addition with the cysteine. Um, most of the studies that have been done on glutathione to raise levels have been done with N-acetylcysteine and not with cysteine. So um, N-acetylcysteine is more stable. Uh, so I would, s I would still prefer N-acetylcysteine because I think you get better absorption and it's much more stable than cysteine. You're still going to get benefits by using just cysteine by itself. Um, but I don't know how the value versus benefit ratio is whether one is better than the other. I tend to be uh, more on the N-acetylcysteine side just because more more more, the, more, more, most of the research done on NAC raising glutathione, most of the research raising glutathione had been done with N acetylcysteine and not cysteine because of its stability and its absorption factors. Anyways, thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank and uh, appreciate everyone joining us. And uh, hopefully, you found something here that was useful. And please share and please follow us on our Facebook page. And please check out our website, Dr. K News, D R K N E W S dot com. And uh, thank you for spending the afternoon with me. Bye.